This week is ho ho ho, which I assume is spelled just like ho ho ho. H O H O H O. No spaces. Uh, this is the last session of this year, and we start up again on January 8th. So don't come here on the 25th or January 1st. And uh, Troy Torgerson is speaking on the 8th. He's fantastic. He's giving us basically an update on newborn screening for immunodeficiency disease which those of us who are internists, at least me, need desperately. Um, today we've got journals, we've got three speakers. Uh, Matt Altman is going to start with the eosinophils, IL-5, and biologics. Um, and then, I don't know the order of the other speakers, but uh, David Hagen and Kevin Dooms are the other two speakers. cut me off at 20 minutes if uh, I'm going over because I will. I have more than I, than, I, than I can necessarily fit in. So um, yeah, that's the title. I'm going to talk about a few things in that realm. Disclosures are none, which at the end of this you might find a little surprising since I'm mostly going to focus on one drug from one company, but that's because that's how the literature goes. Uh, the overview of what I want to talk about um, so I just want to briefly review what uh, IL-5 targeted therapies are out there, and then review several recent articles on both safety and efficacy of anti-IL-5 in basically three specific um, diseases in our, in our field. Uh, the motivation for this is uh, I recently met a patient who I'll give as a quick presentation um, with hyperdeosinophilic syndrome for whom we're currently pursuing anti-IL-5 therapy and also the fact that there have been several recent publications and a lot of ongoing clinical trials in the area, and I think it's a pretty uh, uh, novel area. And just a couple pictures, that's IL-5 down in the corner, a quick review of how these, uh, what these different uh, antibodies are, chimeric versus humanized, and then that's a biopsy of eosinophilic esophagitis, in the, or eosinophilic, uh, hyper eosinophilic syndrome in the bone marrow. <coughs> um, so just briefly, what therapies are out there? Uh, the one that I'll end up focusing on, uh, mepolizumab, which is a GlaxoSmithKline um, product. It's a fully humanized uh, monoclonal IgG1 uh, that's specific for human IL-5. There's a similar product that uh, there's less data about, but um, ongoing trials for a lot of the same stuff I'm going to talk about. Reslizumab, um, which is an IgG4 antibody for the same. A few others, which there's very little evidence about, um, but there's this humanized uh, monoclonal antibody to the IL-5 receptor. Uh, and then there's this experimental drug, which doesn't really have a name yet, which is an antisense uh, oligonucleotide designed for that receptor, although it's uh, fairly, uh, it works on a number of other receptors as well. So things that may come up in the literature over the next few years. Uh, briefly, the case presentation, so this is a kid I met couple months ago. He's 18. He had a long history of allergic rhinitis. Uh, he also had asthma that had sort of resolved in childhood. Um, he was doing quite well until uh, about a year ago when he had 
very marked increase in his pulmonary symptoms. It was sort of presumed asthma again versus some pneumonias. He got treated on and off by his PCP. Uh, he was referred back to us, um, and it was clear that it wasn't simple run-of-the-mill asthma. He was started on prednisone while a workup was started and had a rather markedly high eosinophil count there, as you can see, or a fairly high. Um, unfortunately, while this workup was going on, he actually suffered a cardiac arrest and was hospitalized and in the intensive care unit. Made a, a really stunning recovery, did very well. But while there, he had a markedly low VF, had a cardiac biopsy with uh, pretty extensive eosinophilic infiltration but now you're normal, something they keep on your differential, but had a bone marrow biopsy with increased eosinophils and precursors, similar to that first picture I showed. And then this is stuff not everybody may be familiar with, but I'll come to in a second. So you, we know a couple of the etiologies of hyper eosinophilic syndrome. Um, and notably, there are a handful which are due to uh, fusion proteins, um, but his were all negative, and then T, cloud, T cell tonality studies all negative. Um, and he was basically diagnosed with hyper eosinophilic syndrome. A brief review of that uh, before I get into the literature of IL-5, anti-IL-5 as a treatment for it. So it's a group of disorders with marked overproduction of eosinophils and uh, end organ damage. The definition is basically a high eosinophil count, uh, no other cause for it, and uh, end organ dysfunction as a result of it. They used to have a criteria that it has to be present for more than six months. That's really been rejected because a lot of these people get into trouble well before six months. Um, so if you can rule out other etiologies, you should make the diagnosis. So over the last, I would say, eight, ten years, a fair bit of work has been done in delineating what different causes of this disease are. Um, Number one is uh, this myeloproliferative variant, which is due to fusion proteins um, between different tyrosine kinases. kinases so the uh, platelet-derived growth factor alpha is the most common and well-described, but there are uh, two other potential, and then BCR able is always checked as well, although it's not known to cause the disease. Then there are these T-cell lymphocytic variants, which are usually due to a T-cell clone that produces IL-5. Those are particularly high risk because they can turn into a T-cell malignancy. There's a familial autosomal dominant form. The gene's not known, but it's been mapped. And then, unfortunately, three quarters of cases are still unknown. Uh, quickly, the conventional treatments for this. So you usually use steroids, um, which lead to apoptosis. So they're sort of you know, getting rid of the eosinophils, but not targeting um, the genesis, you know, the initial uh, creation of them in the bone marrow. For this myeloproliferative variant, um, Gleevec has been found quite markedly effective in its sort of first-line therapy in addition to, to upfront steroids for the small number of patients who do have that. So it's definitely worth looking for. And then beyond that, it's pretty nonspecific, uh, and there's not much good stuff. So hydroxyurea was first used, I think, in the 70s. Interferon alpha <coughs> has an effect. Uh, it's got a lot of side effects. And then any other number of you know, chemotherapeutics and immune suppressants have been tried with pretty limited effect. So it's definitely a disease that was in need of new therapy. Um, and basically, anti IL 5, on the face of it, would make sense, assuming that the eosinophils hadn't sort of escaped the IL 5 uh, pathway. So the first study, this is going back, I'll come to the more modern one in a second. This is from 2004. It was a quick pilot study of four patients. Um, who had, at this time, myeloproliferative variants were not known. In retrospect, they went back and looked at the patients, but there were four of them. It ended up two of them had idiopathic, four of them had the myeloproliferative variant, and they all got IV mepolizumab. At, I'll point out this is a, re, a very low dose compared to the trials I'm going to come to. And basically, two patients had a market effect. They just got a single dose, and they basically followed eosinophil count. Two of them dropped very rapidly and stayed low for a while. One of them had a very brief drop and came back up more quickly. You can see these are different time scales. And then one of them had no effect at this dose. Uh, in retrospect, two of these patients I know, said had the myeloproliferative variant, uh, patient one on this side and patient three on this side. Because of this, uh, between 2004 and 2006, another more you know, comprehensive trial was pursued. And this was sort of a landmark thing that came out in the New England Journal in 08. Uh, it was basically a double-blind placebo-controlled um, trial. I'm going to 
focus on this and then a spin-off of this paper that was published just a couple months ago as the main point of my talk. So they basically looked at uh, 85 patients uh, with hypereosinophilic syndrome without this fusion gene, so idiopathic or T-cell clonal process. Um, patients had to have, they didn't have to be refractory to therapy, but they had to have a run-in uh, period of just being on prednisone at you know, a reasonably high dose and had to be clinically stable. And then they either got a much higher dose, so 750 milligrams compared to one mg per kg, versus placebo. Uh, just very briefly on this slide I want to show, so basically every one week they would taper down the prednisone dose, provided there was clinical stability and the eosinophil count was less than 750. Um, and then I just wanted to point out, because this is relevant I think in the analysis, uh, I think the authors really underplay their results a little bit. Um, in large part because of this. So the uh, placebo group had a market, you know, very high withdrawal rate. Uh, basically half of the patients withdrew, most of them because of ineffective therapy uh, compared to a much lower rate, only seven patients in the uh, treatment group. So the endpoints of the study were reduction of prednisone dose to less than 10 for a sustained period for eight weeks. Secondary endpoints they predefined were a lowered eosinophil count then this is sort of the inverse, so time to failure. Um, and then they had a few other measures of decreased prednisone dose that were not quite as stringent as this first one. Post hoc, so not really statistically valid, but just exploring the data, they looked for a more sustained um, decrease in the prednisone dose. And the, the results were really pretty stunning, and again, I think a little bit underplayed by the author. They, just weren't, they were mostly trying to show that this is somewhat effective and safe um, for future use, but so in the primary endpoint up here in the left corner, basically there was a, a very statistically significant difference. 84% of patients on mepolizumab um, were able to come down to low doses of prednisone. 40% uh, of placebo, which is actually kind of surprisingly high, um, but nevertheless uh, not as good as placebo. Um, and I think, again, that doesn't fully capture the, the efficacy of it, so I'll come to it. Uh, this was one of the secondary endpoints, so this is time to treatment failure over the course of the study, um, the 36 weeks or so. So basically, and failure, I think I defined on the previous slide, was basically an addition of another drug, high dose prednisone over 60 or withdrawal from the study. Only 30% of uh, placebo patients did not fail um, compared to... Uh, uh, 70% of, uh, or sorry, 80% of uh, patients on mepolizumab uh, uh, did not have treatment failure, even if they were not fully able to taper the prednisone. Um, and then the, uh, another secondary endpoint, just looking at the, um, or no, so this is the post hoc, so this is just looking for more sustained effect. So half of the patients on mepolizumab were still at very low dose prednisone at the end of the study, 24 weeks into it. Um, and then this is looking at the, uh, this uh, graph in the middle, looking at the mean prednisone dose between the groups. And it doesn't look that stunning, uh, you know, at the end. There's not that big a difference. But again, I think the authors are sort of not making it look as good as they could because this is only the patients who were retained in the study. If you, this, this last thing that I highlighted out here is if you look at the last um, dose at the time of the last follow-up, so including all the patients who dropped out, there's a much more marked difference, um, again, with half of the patients in the placebo group dropping out. Um, this is a supplementary figure, which, again, I think really highlights how sort of consistently effective the mepolizumab is. These are the patients who completed the study. These are those who didn't. So just looking at placebo versus uh, treatment of those who completed the study, you can see those on mepolizumab had a quick drop in their eosinophils and stayed at a nice, consistently low level throughout. Those on placebo were up and down um, throughout, suggesting they were having flares. They were not, even though they were trying to force these patients to taper, uh, you know, they were often having to go back up. So this led into a much more recent paper that probably people have not seen as much. Uh, this is not even published in print yet. Um, it's an online publication only that came out in October. And it's basically an open label extension of that trial we just went through. Um, and the people who were eligible for it 
were basically uh, either the patients who had gotten mepolizumab or those in the placebo group, so they could switch over to use of mepolizumab. Primary endpoints were the frequency of adverse events. That's really all they were looking at was safety, or the main thing they were looking at was safety of the drug. They did go ahead and look at some secondary endpoints as well in terms of could they change the dosing frequency previously to been every four weeks, could they space it out? What was the steroid sparing effect? And then are there any uh, anti-drug um, antibodies that are developed? And again, it's pretty stunning data. Um, so they had 78 of those initial 85 patients who, who continued. The mean duration of therapy was, or the range was four to 302 weeks, but most of them were on it for uh, quite a long time. So about five years is the average. Um, this was not their primary endpoint, but I think important to, to kind of bury it in the paper. Uh, but again, highlighting sort of the effect of it. So this is the, the uh, average prednisone dose. These are the patients who, from that initial New England Journal paper, were already on mepolizumab and were predictably already on a low dose. This is those who crossed over from the placebo group, who again had a rapid, uh, relatively rapid down titration of their prednisone. Um, this is what the paper was designed to look at, adverse events, and there were quite a few, um, and they really go into them in quite a bit of detail. Ones that I think are worth, that, that they certainly highlight as a concern, so there was this one patient who, can, who developed an angioimmunoblastic T-cell lymphoma, which the, the researchers said could be due to the drug. T-cell lymphomas are actually a fairly well-known side of, you know, um, or development of uh, hyperiosinophilic syndrome in those who have a T-cell clone. They don't actually say if this patient initially had a T-cell clone as the driving cause of the disease, um, which I'm surprised. I don't know if it wasn't looked for or what, but again, that's not that abnormal in a group of patients with this severe disease. Um, another relevant thing is one patient had this episode of transverse myelitis, which they think may have been an infusion reaction, although it's not been reported in any other papers with use of anti-IL-5. And then, you know, they really focus on cancers, so they go through all the cancers, and they do note that there were two new prostate cancers, which is significantly higher than you'd expect by random chance in 78 patients, um, you know, by background population, but it's hard to come up with a causal link there. And then uh, here they're basically just reporting, so these are all the serious adverse events that occurred in at least two subjects. It's worth looking at the actual um, uh, text because there are quite a few others. So there was also this episode of a T cell, a cutaneous T cell lymphoma in one patient, although again, that's not an entirely unexpected uh, uh, secondary endpoint or second, you know, secondary disease from uh, HES. There was one multiple myeloma, which again is higher than you would expect than uh, in just a general population, one out of 78 people. Um, one other possible infusion reaction, which was a diffuse or carryal reaction. And then again, just because we're immunologists and focus on um, you know, immunologic, potentially immunologic effects of such a drug, there were development of five other non-allergic immune diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, PMR, temporal arteritis, and uh, ITP and lysinglitis. So, you know, things to think about, although if you look at the other papers, other studies of anti-IL-5, most of these have not been reported. So it makes you wonder if it has something to do with the underlying disease um, rather than the drug itself. So the secondary endpoints, they were able to space out the dosing fairly effectively uh, um, from really four weeks to anywhere from 9 to 12, and there were no neutralizing antibodies. And then just looking at the duration of response to the drug at longer time points, uh, pretty good. So 62% were completely steroid free on no other drug for over 12 weeks, 61 for over a year, and 40 for over three years. And it's worth noting that these patients were sort of out in the community at this point, and it was at the discretion of their primary provider. So some of these patients just went on to low dose steroids, um, many of them rather than onto anything high. Uh, so that was basically what motivated all this and um, the main focus of my, my talk here. Uh, basically a disease that you wouldn't, on the face of it, necessarily expect this therapy to be effective. Um, but I think the data over the last few years has been pretty striking. And I think it will be the first line therapy for this drug in the not too distant future. Um, 
Briefly, I wanted to touch on a few other things. So Church Strauss, another disease we see, and it's sometimes confused with hyper-eosinophilic syndrome or sometimes hard to separate out. The studies of mepolizumab with this are kind of at the same stage that it was with hyper-eosinophilic syndrome eight years ago during that blood paper. There is a, a recent study of, um, in 2010, of just a pilot study, seven patients treated the same way as those in the mepolizumab um, study, uh, so with this relatively high dose, and all of them had a fairly market effect. This is one paper from the, one figure from the paper basically showing this was the treatment window from 0 to 12, and this is one of seven subjects. They don't have a mean, but it's representative. Uh, almost all the patients had a fairly quick decrease in their steroid dose, a marked drop in their eosinophil count, um, and it was sustained throughout the treatment window. As soon as they came off the drug, this is representative of flare of the churd strauss and then over time the eosinophils come back up, the steroid dose goes back up. So briefly, they showed that the mean dose, they were able to decrease from 13, which doesn't seem that high, uh, to 5, and then it went back up after the washout period from uh, the several doses of the drug. Um, and they had a markedly decreased uh, exacerbation rate while they were on the drug compared to the time before and time after while they were off. Uh, and there were, there were no severe adverse events uh, in those seven patients. This is just a table of it. It says the same thing. There's another thing, another paper very similar that came out a year later, uh, almost the uh, same thing. It was 10 patients of the pilot study, and basically eight out of the 10 responded well. It was odd. It was published as a letter rather than as a full paper, so they don't have all the data there. Um, but nevertheless, further support of its use for this uh, disease as well. Um, I'll probably stop there. I was just going to highlight briefly. I'm sure people are aware of these papers, but... You know, so the idea is, can mepolizumab be used more generally for other eosinophilic diseases? So trying to define a subgroup of asthma patients uh, that are primi primarily eosinophilic. There were two papers in the New England Journal in 2009 that showed a decrease in exacerbations um, in a predefined group of asthmatics. And then for people to read or for me to present another time, there's a paper that just came out, the DREAM trial, in August of this year which builds off of that a significantly larger 680 patients with eosinophilic asthma, again, with showing a pretty markedly decreased um, rate of exacerbations while on mepolizumab, um, suggesting that it may be a therapy in that disease as well. And I think it's relevant just because, well, I was talking to Rennie Carr the other day, sometimes it's hard to separate out these diseases. I mean, the thought that maybe some severe refractory asthmatics are like a limited church strauss um, anyway, but there's probably a population where this would be effective. So a quick summary, I just wanted to show strong and growing evidence for the use of anti-IL-5 for hyperosinophilic syndrome, uh, limited but prominent evidence for Chirk strauss and then data for us all to explore about its efficacy in certain asthmatics. And that's that. How soon after the prednisone was stopped did your patient develop the cardiac arrest, and how quickly was that? Uh, he'd been off of it for like a week, so it's pretty quick. Yeah, Did they biopsy his heart to see if it was eosinophilic vasculitis? They, yeah. yeah, it wasn't vasculitic, but it was marked eosinophilic infiltration. There was, luckily for him, minimal fibrosis at that point. So it's, EF has actually improved back towards normal. Why do they think they got a 40% success rate in the placebo group? It's a good question. I mean, you know, it was basically a forced presence on a paper. So it's something that probably had not been tried in these patients before. Um, you know, and uh, they don't say a lot about it, but uh, I guess if you try to do, if you put them on a regimented trial, you can probably get them off for a short while, so they can clear them back up. You can do it. So I'm going on the eosinophil thing. I wanted to bundle together a lot of the articles that came out this past year about eosinophil sarcomatitis and use this as a forum to say that I'm really confused about this disease, and I'm probably not the only one. Um, no conflicts to disclose. So by way of background, um, we know that EOE can be triggered by foods. We know that inhaled allergens are also probably a factor in some cases. Um, the common food triggers also parallel just the major food allergens we see for food allergy in general. And we know that we can remit, so the disease can be remitted with um, elemental formula, and then you can also reintroduce symptoms by bringing foods back together, or back in the uh, diet. I wonder if there's other triggers. Maybe there is a true uh, 
GE reflux, sensitive, EOE. Um, maybe there's intrinsic factors, things we haven't thought about yet. One of the things that I really struggle with is testing, um, how to test, how to interpret it, and then how to apply it in the patients. There are a lot of different treatment options. You know, there's followed steroids, there are avoidance diets. Um, I find in my practice, most of the families come to me thinking, if I eliminate a food or certain foods, this disease will go away. Sometimes I just wish they would do swallowed steroids, but that's often not the case. Um, you may be familiar with the Empiric S-Fed diet or the six food elimination diet. And this is looking at milk, egg, soy, wheat, peanuts, and, and seafoods. Just taking these six foods and empirically eliminating them and seeing where that takes you. So the first study came out in June. Um, this was a, a retrospective study, and we'll find that all these three studies are retrospective. Um, they had a large uh, group of uh, eosinophilic GI disease patients, but only enrolled 98. And the reason being is a lot of the patients are actually already on corticosteroids, and so they, they washed out in terms of enrollment. Uh, the studies are also very similar. There's a lot of kids ages 5, 6, mostly boys, mostly Caucasian, and almost all were uh, verified EOE by uh, histologic evidence, so 15 EOs per high power field. And the vast majority had failed a trial of PPI going into this, so knowing that it's not just bad reflux and also not a uh, PPI uh, sensitive form of EOE. So in the study, they looked at different dietary therapies and compared to them, or compared to how um, they worked. And so the first was elemental diet. Half these patients were randomized. I'm sorry, they weren't randomized. They were just, this is retrospective, so they looked at um, the half the kids who had elemental diet, and they always got better, obviously. A quarter of the kids were on empiric six-fit elimination diet. And then the next quarter were just directed by testing. So when you did uh, prick and patch testing, you decided which foods to avoid and see how it works. So in terms of the uh, their skin testing, they did up to 62 foods and another 11 environmental allergens, depending, and then a very standard uh, patch testing uh, methodology. So looking at the uh, histologic remission, uh, they define it as less than 15 EOs per high power field, um, and that was just the histologic definition of remission. Of course, in elemental diet, almost all the kids got better. We know this from previous studies. Uh, what's impressive is the SFED, the uh, empiric six food elimination diet, so just stabbing at it, saying don't eat these six foods, 82% success rate. Uh, a little depressing in that uh, if you add on uh, prick and patch test directed avoidance on top of the empiric six food, you're only at 80%. So in effect, that testing is almost worthless according to these numbers. If you took just kids who were uh, directed by uh, the testing results, you had only 65% success rate. So I'm not real encouraging there. Uh, in this particular study, three-fourths of the kids were, uh, their foods were reintroduced, uh, whether it's single or multiple foods, depending on the child. And uh, when they failed, in other words, they reintroduced foods and symptoms or histologic evidence was, uh, or it was recrudescence, uh, milk was by far the most common antigen, uh, followed by eggs, soy, and wheat. And over here on the table, uh, you'll see the three different uh, uh, columns you have, the elemental diet, the six-foot six elimination, and then a skin test-directed diet. And in terms of the uh, eosinophil count, going into the study, there's a lot of variability, um, which of course is an enrollment problem. But again, this wasn't randomized. Uh, you can't help but wonder if there's something about these three groups that was different. Um, and keep in mind that you know, these families have chosen these particular diets uh, for various reasons, you know, convenience or cost, and that probably sorted them out in different reasons. Um, when you uh, came back, where is it? after the, uh, the diet therapy, you had dramatic decreases in eosinophil. So we're doing something, at least with food avoidance, we're getting somewhere. Um, they have so, a control group. What if you do nothing and you would buy them? That's actually a great, a, a great question. I'm not sure that anybody's done that. I mean, maybe they get better if you do nothing. Right, and that's the question about natural history. Where does this disease go over time? And on that thing, can you know how many uh, the disease came back when they reintroduced the food? Um, high or low? Or? It was high. I mean, basically they showed that you were able to cause the disease again by bringing the foods back. But again, one of the biases, though, is that this is an allergic population, as we'll see. And so what about the non-allergic patients? You know, I know they're out there. We know they're out there. So take comes from the study. We know that uh, dietary therapy can induce remission. Uh, we know that elemental diets are far superior to restriction diets. but They're much harder. Um, what about these test-guided uh, elimination diets? Uh, maybe they're not any better than just guessing at it. When you look at just the predictive value of skin prick testing, it's uh, 67% in able, or to be able to uh, predict for mission. Um, and so is that acceptable or not? And the authors had a more dire approach. They said, taken together, our study does not substantiate a role 
reliable role for skin testing and dietary therapy for EOE. So you know, it makes an allergist wonder, like, what's our role in all this? The next study, and I apologize, there's that computer glitch yesterday. I don't have um, these slides in your handout. This is a retrospective uh, study at CHOP. They looked at the effectiveness of, again, test-directed diets uh, in patients with EOE. They had a larger database and were able to enroll um, almost 800 kids in the study, again, retrospective. Uh, similar uh, to characteristics, young kids, age five or six, more boys, more Caucasian, and a very high prevalence of allergic disorders. And so either they're present, and there was atopy is a very significant problem in this, or maybe there's a selection bias, I'm not sure. So they also excluded kids who had responded to PPI. Uh, they also uh, skipped over the kids who had other eosinophilic GI disorders, so gastritis or colitis. And then um, kind of thinking of what Matt was talking about, they also took out their kids who had anti-L5 therapy for other studies. So in this one, they did skin testing to uh, those suspected triggers clinically. So the parents came in, they said, I think this food, or I think that food, tested to those, plus a standard panel of all these other ones that a lot of us probably do anyway in our clinics. So when you look at the EOE triggers in these kids, again, milk comes up really positive. Um, if you look in the table one here, you have milk, you know, head and shoulders above all the rest in terms of its ability uh, to cause biopsy changes or uh, changes in clinical symptoms. Uh, egg, wheat, and soy were the next uh, foods. And then um, what's interesting, uh, peanut was by far the most common trigger of classic IgE-mediated symptoms here. So if you looked at ordinary food allergy, peanut came up. And um, I thought egg was funny because egg kind of spanned both. It had uh, a nice role in EOE and in food allergy. And one question I had, you know, here's 15% of kids who had classic you know, food allergy pop up during this uh, trial. Maybe it's just a comorbid condition. Maybe it's happening at the same time. I'm not quite sure. Um, looking at uh, table two yeah, here. How, how did you identify those as triggers? Was, so, that, a, was that a reintroduction? Reintroduction, okay. exactly. So reintroduction and then histologic changes and then um, clinical symptom changes. These are different uh, food combinations when they reintroduced. And so milk, meats, egg, and grains. It's curious that a lot of this is uh, animal products. And I'm not quite sure if that's because we just tend to eat that way or if that's actually because they're just really potent triggers. Um, I'm going to kind of do my best to explain the numbers here. So this is looking at uh, skin prick testing and negative predictive values, positive predictive values. So just the skin test has pretty good negative predictive value, kind of like with ordinary skin testing for ordinary allergy. Milk has to be an exception, it seems, in every case. Uh, very poor negative predictive value. So a negative skin test to milk doesn't mean milk isn't playing a role in EOE. Um, in terms of the positive predictive value, about 50%, give or take. And that's pretty similar, again, to regular skin testing for regular allergy. Now, the authors wanted to, I think they kind of are big proponents of uh, patch testing. So you have skin prick testing and ITP patch testing. Uh, fairly similar negative predictive value to ordinary uh, skin testing. So it's a lot of work to get pretty much the same number. Likewise, in terms of the um, positive predictive value, milk has to be an outlier here, too. So milk is sort of funny in, in, in all the rules. This is interesting. So they, uh, they took their test-guided eliminations. And then they added just empiric milk. They said, we'll do all this work with all this skin testing. We're going to you know, pick these foods to avoid. And by the way, just don't do milk, um, which I think is kind of a, a way a lot of allergists do this now. And they had around you know, three-fourths of the patients getting better. So not too shabby. So again, in this study, they, had, um, they were able to, able, to, able to identify foods in around half the patients. Uh, it was not randomized. You had sort of any number of uh, diets sort of changing throughout the course of the treatment. Um, and then, um, of course, a lot of kids have atopy. Interesting, the authors said that there were sort of two major groups that fell out, more observationally speaking. They had the kids who had a couple major allergens, so those classic milk, egg, soy, wheat, and so forth. They tended to be older. The kids who were younger tend to have more foods that were sensitive to, and um, they included things like fruits and vegetables. And so maybe there's something intrinsic about these younger kids who tend to be more sensitive than the older ones. Um, so a take home from this uh, study is that elimination based on the skin testing, all the work that we do, was just as good as guessing. In other words, taking that empiric elimination of the six foods uh, was just as good as all the work that we do. Um, one of the advantages of the empiric diet is that it may actually mean fewer foods to avoid. And there are those who actually custom tailor the six food elimination diet and say, let's just do milk, egg, and soy, or let's just do milk. Um, and that makes it even easier. 
And so the question is, can you get better adherence and better long-term um, outcomes from a more empiric, limited elimination diet? So I want to really like this study today. This is the um, study that came out of a Peds GI journal uh, this month. And at Northwestern, as a part of a larger study, they um, took out 17 kids who they just had them eliminate milk. They said, we could test you, we could do a six food, but let's just do milk and see what happens. And so it was a six-week trial of dairy elimination in these kids. Primary endpoint was looking at the number of eosinophils per high power field, so 15 or greater. They tried to stratify the results in terms of complete or significant remission of eosinophils, and uh, I think they kind of abandoned that in some ways because it was taking a very small population and trying to get numbers where they didn't exist. Uh, the secondary endpoint was clinical symptoms. So you can see that a lot of these patients were relying, not only in this study and in previous studies, on the histologic evidence. What do the eosinophils tell us in the esophagus? And so, um, I'm going to skip the rest of that. I, I didn't know they did so many biopsies in some of these studies. Actually, four in the mid-esophagus and then four circumferentially around the uh, distal esophagus. And uh, I also didn't know that the pathologist would actually sort of spot check and sort of look at the area that has the highest amount of eosinophils and go there and count there. And so that's a little bit of an interesting point. Yeah, exactly. So um, here are the results. Um, they, uh, they looked at this milk-only elimination in the context of all of the different uh, uh, treatments they do in their center. Um, there are 161 different kinds of treatments. 61% um, were some form of elimination. So here are the 17 kids we're talking about in the study, plus the other elimination diets, whether those be six-food elimination or not. Uh, a quarter of the kids roughly were on swallowed steroids, which is probably more than I see in my practice, and then some other, other kinds of diets. Um, so again, looking at kids who just avoided milk, there was remission in around 65% in a small study. Uh, they spent some time parsing the results in terms of significant or, you know, uh, what do you call it, complete remission. And if you look at the number of eosinophils, oops, it's very interesting that the pre-elimination eosinophil counts were pretty high. Uh, there's also a lot of variability. They also are very low um, after the, uh, the milk elimination diet. So there's definitely something to this. Um, if you look at the secondary outcomes in terms of clinical symptoms, they reported improvements in all symptoms. But this can be pretty you know, variable in terms of the recall. Um, here are the symptoms, vomiting, dysphagia, regurgitation, coughing. So a decent number of symptoms, and then they almost fell out altogether um, at the end of the study. So when you talk about a single elimination of just milk, they were able to receive, I'm sorry, achieve histologic remission in 65% of patients. That's pretty good for not a lot of work. Uh, they really lauded the fact that this is an easy um, application. You know, we've got a higher uh, rate probably of uh, compliance, and maybe this is an easy way to keep patients in a long-term maintenance uh, mode where you have less of the potential for a long-term you know, tissue, re tissue remodeling or strictures, um, but we don't really know where this is going to go as a disease. Um, <coughs> So really, the state of the art right now with EOE is we have very little presentations. We have allergic kids, but non-allergic adults. Um, I've actually started seeing patients who are asymptomatic. So kids who have uh, GI, uh, GI workups for various problems, and on the way in, they see eosinophils, microabscesses, furrows, and so forth. And these are kids who have no symptoms whatsoever. And so are they pre-EOE? I mean, are there a lot of people out there who have these histologic changes with no symptoms? I don't know. Um, and then what's the role of the allergist in allergy testing? I mean, I'm convinced that there's a role for uh, at least prick testing. I'm not so sure about patch testing, but maybe it's only a limited role. And then one author said maybe to mitigate this problem, we should talk about using fresh food extracts. And that's something I've thought about from time to time. And then in terms of state-of-the-art for treatment, you know, there's debate about whether we should start with the PPI trial. My attitude is if you can get you know, remission of the disease with just an easy PPI, you're way ahead of the game because there's a lot less to do in terms of the food elimination. Um, Again, a major question is, do you do elimination diets or do you do swallowed steroids? And I'm really convinced now that milk is a major player and then six feet elimination has a role in this. Um, and then, like I said before, wh where does disease go? Like, what are the long-term risks? Uh, are these kids at risk for aggressive esophagitis? I'm just not sure. So um, I'm confused, and who else is? <laughs> so the question is, what is the role of, 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 of the allergist, right? Yeah. I mean, let, yeah, I would battle with this too. I think I, you know, I used to do patch testing when I first got here. We, talk, we talked about this, but I haven't done it in a long time just because I think the data doesn't really show that it's very helpful. And a lot of these um, elimination diets seem to have very similar success rates. Although I would, I would argue that that 
six food elimination diets really eat foods, right? Cause yeah, right. It's right. Uh, milk, egg, wheat, peanut, tree nut, fin fish, shellfish. I and mean, when you add it all up, it's actually eight foods. Yeah. And, you know, I've had, just anecdotally, I've had good success with just starting with milk. I mean, when you tell a parent and that six-year-old kid to avoid all of these foods, you know, if it's six to eight foods, that's kind of ridiculous in my opinion. Um, and, you know, if, and if we're going to do that, we always have to make sure that they see a registered dietitian. I think if you see, have a child who's avoiding more than one or two food groups, they should probably have a dietitian, unless the parents are, are super savvy. Um, but I think, but there's also some, as far as our rule, I mean, there's good, there, there's some case reports and a lot of uh, references looking at um, uh, environmental inhal inhalant sensitization um, and that the diagnosis of EUE might be a seasonal thing where, you know, during the spring and summer, these patients are diagnosed more often and it might be more symptomatic. So at least from our standpoint, I think the one thing that we have to hang on to is potentially helping those patients with uh, their other ecopic conditions like allergic rhinitis, et cetera. That's important. Um, yeah, and I, so if anyone's interested, we're gonna meet with GI tomorrow at GI Children's and kind of have a little powwow. I think Frank Ferrant's coming, Kevin's coming. Um, it's at 7.30 tomorrow at Children's. Um, and we're gonna come up with, you know, just sit around for an hour and talk about you know, what to do with these patients. Because I think everyone's is it so a meat food elimination diet without any kind of testing or evidence for parents? What's that? How easy is it to sell an elimination diet without any <laughs> kind, of, some kind of evidence? It's tough. Of I mean, yeah, it's tough. And it, there, I mean, there's some evidence out there, right, you know, to say that it helps, but... Well, parents are actually very motivated. They're yeah. so yeah. scared yeah. of it that they're willing to do it. But I think that we <laughs> yeah. wear them out with the yeah, elimination. Exactly. And it's sort of a battle of attrition. Yeah, right. okay. Kevin, did you come across, I'm curious about the milk deal. What's up with the fact that half of them don't have positive skin or patch tests? I mean, like, yeah. what, is a doctor speculated, like, how milk is playing a role? Is milk it just a funny. cell response? Or well, you think a patch yeah. test would be positive if it's yeah. a T-cell no, media. Well, the question is, what are they using for the patches? I know, so when I was at Well, that's true, too. You know, yeah. I think they would use milk powder and... Yeah. And I think they would, I don't know, if, I think they would put water in there, but I, or they would put fresh milk to kind of soften it up. And so maybe the, the vehicle, because you can't really put fresh milk in, 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 a, that's true. in, a, in a little disc, that it's going to fall, it's going to drip out. Again. So that's, that could be <laughs> one issue. I think uh, fresh foods is definitely an interesting point. I yeah. didn't really think about that. Yeah. Well, we were talking in the practice about this the other day, and I've, I've had four or five adolescents that all had OAS prior to yeah. getting their EOA, and just for fun, I tested a few of the foods, and like their carrot went from three to 30, and eliminating, and then once they had a normal biopsy, which took a while, they were, the foods went back to where they were before, and it didn't seem to cause recurrence. So it's a very bizarre. <laughs> I'm gonna cut this off, not because it's not important, but I want David to have yeah. time. Um, so I won't be speaking about any elevin of fields. And when I was looking for a topic to talk about, I came across this title, which uh, it said, Immune Cell for Activity Triggered by Drug Modified HLA Peptide Repair Drug. So I didn't understand what it means, so I had to read it again. So I read it again. <laughs> I think by the, by the third time I had to read the paper to understand that they were speaking about a back of your hypersensitivity syndrome. And going over the literature, I think that uh, represent, um, we can tell a nice story about how the mechanism of a baccaviral hypersensitivity syndrome uh, was uh, discovered or presented uh, yet. <laughs> so what is a baccaviral hypersensitivity syndrome? A baccaviral is an NRTI, in the closet reverse trans transcriptase inhibitor, and early, back in 1998, when uh, the pre-marketing phase of the drug was initiated, then there were multiple reports about hypersensitivity syndrome, um, also rare reports of mortality associated with failure to recognize uh, this clinical syndrome. Um, as, far, as far as the concern for epidemiology, the, the incidence is about something between 5 to 8 percent, uh, more common in whites, and the symptoms are very non-specific, I would say. So the diagnosis is based on the combination of clinical symptoms and signs, and you have you must have multi-system involvement. So fever is one of the uh, signs, constitutional symptoms, GI symptoms, 
respiratory symptoms and a rash which is absent in 30% of the patient. If you can, even if you think about it, this is, these are the symptoms of a common viral infection, I would think. But the combination of these symptoms with recent initiation of a Bacavir uh, should support the diagnosis. 3% uh, of the patient will develop isolated rash without any other symptoms and they do not have Bacavir hypersensitivity syndrome. The median time uh, to onset is between seven to eight days. Um, although symptoms can start as early as one to two days after treatment and up to, it says, three weeks, other papers suggest six weeks after starting a Bacavir. Rechallenge results in reappearance of symptoms within hours uh, and is basically contraindicated and can be life-threatening. You can do a skin patch testing, which helps to define those patients with history that suggest uh, Abacavir hypersensitivity syndrome to confirm actually the diagnosis of AHS. Um, if you test patients before they are exposed to Abacavir, you will never get a positive skin patch testing, so, which actually based, it's actually, uh, so it can only confirm the diagnosis of AHS. Symptoms usually remit promptly after drug discontinuation. So my, when I read about this syndrome, the general feeling I got that it is not very severe uh, systemic reaction, but need to be recognized because we, if we won't stop the drug, then it might progress into a more severe uh, disease. Four, four years later, after Abacavir was initiated, there was, a, there was two papers which described some association between Abacavir hypersensitivity syndrome and HLA B5701. Uh, the same were published by the same uh, the same uh, month. The first one found that 14 out of 18 patients with uh, the syndrome were positive for HLA B5701, and the second one found 40, 46% of the patient out of 80 patients uh, were positive for the same HLA B region. Uh, four years later, in 2008, there was the PREDICT study which basically try to say, to see if you will test the patient before uh, you start treat, treating them with a back of you for HLAP 5701, will you be able to prevent uh, the hypersensitivity reaction? And what they found that screening actually eliminated all the immunologically confirmed, which means people who had positive patch test hypersensitivity reaction with a negative predictive value of 100%. So if you have negative HLA screening, you will have negative skin tests, and most probably you will not have the hypersensitivity of, uh, syndrome. And based on that, uh, the FDA was recommending to, genetic, to do genetic uh, testing before starting treatment with a Bacavir. So what is the mechanism? And this is an early morning mechanism. Um, just a short reminder of how things are supposed to work. When we talk about MHC and TCR interaction, the MHC class one starts uh, in the ER. It usually presents peptides, which the cell normally makes. Uh, old peptides or abnormal peptides are being degraded. They are transported into the ER. They bind to the MHC, and only once the MHC um, and the peptide are bind together, then the MHC peptide complex will go to the cell surface. The next step will be T-cell APC antigen pre presenting cell interaction. And for T-cell to recognize uh, the peptide, you need um, the TCR to recognize both the, pep the peptide and the MHC molecule. So if you have a TCR which can recognize the peptide and not the MHC, there will be no recognition. TCR recognizing the MHC but not the peptide, again, no recognition. The next step will be T-cell proliferation and the T cell will gain its effector function and do whatever it's supposed to do. So, Abacavir hypersensitivity syndrome is associated with class one HLA, that's the HLA-B. So it must be associated with CD8 activation. Um, in 2008, there was immunity, an immunity paper which draw, check cells from HIV patients who had the Abacavir hypersensitivity reaction. They took lymphocytes, stimulate them uh, with Abacavir, or without Abacavir, and they actually saw interferon gamma secretion, which means CD8 activation. So CD8 are actually being activated when uh, lymphocytes are exposed to Abacavir. The, the second question they wanted to answer, what, which kind of MHC uh, does this CD8 T cell should, be, should see in order to be activated? So they checked several uh, HLA, 
which have similar structure, and only when the CD8 were stimulated with HLA B5701 in the, pres in the presence of a Bacavir, then you got the CD8 uh, activation. Another paper this year, actually, there were three papers published one month apart. The first one uh, was published in Nature after school, and it was scooping the other two. So the second one was published in PNAS, and the third one in AIDS. Um, and first, they repeated the same test. They show again that CD8 are being activated only when they are being uh, um, stimulated with HLA B5701. Other HLA, which have similar structure but not exactly the same, cannot activate CD8 T cell. So we got significant activation here and no activation here. The next question was uh, what does this MET molecule actually have within them? So they did IP and HPLC, which means basically that they took the MET complex, the one with the peptide, they used some antibody to separate this MET peptide complex, and they checked what kind of peptide or molecule this MET molecule have with in them. So the first thing they saw that uh, when you take HL, HLA molecule from a Bacavir stimulated cells, then you get this little bump, and this little bump was found to be a Bacavir itself. So the Abacavir was found within the, the MET, the HLA molecule. It's no, it wasn't any metabolite of the Abacavir, but the Abacavir itself. They were doing some crystallization studies, and they could find the Abacavir, could find the Abacavir within the MET molecule. And not just within the MET molecule, these are, this is the cleft where the antigen is being supposed to be presented. Uh, so this is exactly the binding site of the protein. Again, um, if we check and look them at, and if we search and check the MHC on the cell surface, all the MHC on the cell surface has always some kind of peptide bind to them. You can't find any MHC without any peptide. So they again went to the same, did the same thing. And this time they checked what peptide are being presented on these MHCs, um, either with or without the Abacavir stimulation. And they sequenced each and every peptide. So they found over 3,000 peptides that can be presented by this specific uh, MHC molecule. And the interesting thing is that once the cells are being incubated with a Bacavir, then you got over 900 new peptides uh, which are being presented. Um, so actually there is a massive shift in, in the peptides that are being presented by uh, the HLA. And this is kind of a new self that the cell are presenting. This is not only single um, T cell clone that will be stimulated by that. We got a new, a new self that's being presented and we can expect multiple T cells to be activated. So we spoke about what happened on the APCs. That's different new peptides which are being presented. What happened to the T cells uh, in the body? Um, so they checked the reactive CD8 T cells uh, to see if we have one clone of T cells or multiple clones of T cells. And they stain for the, B, the beta chain of the TCR. Each color represents a different TCR and they checked it in different uh, patients and they saw that you actually can get many TCRs activated in each and every patient. So this is not uh, monoclonal activation, this is polyclonal activation and what we get is self neoepitope induced by Abacavir, and uh, that leads to expansion of polyclonal T cells. And these T cells probably mediate the hypersensitivity response. But Abacavir is not the only one out there. Um, similar association between drug reaction and HLA, different HLA, was also described with different drugs, and there's a long list. Um, the most prominent are allopurinol and carbamazepine, with HLA B5801 or B1502. And if you'll check that another list, another, uh, other drugs, uh, other HLA being associated with the reaction, and if you'll check the structure that you can see that the Bacavir, allopurinol, and carbamazepine have a similar structure. So they checked carbamazepine again, because carbamazepine has the same warning. Um, if you have a patient who has genetic risk um, for uh, severe reaction with carbamazepine, then you should screen them. Uh, for HLA B1502. And again, they repeated the same thing. Uh, carbamazepine could be found within the HLA itself. Again, it was sitting within the antigen binding uh, cleft at the same, si on the same site. 
And if they again check the peptide, then again they could, uh, they could see massive shift in the peptide that are being presented. So if we think about the interaction or the way that a new drug can affect the interaction between HLA and TCR, there are three scenarios. One of them is Hapten-like effect in which uh, the drug will um, bind to the peptide on the HLA. And in this case, we will expect mono I would expect monoclonal expansion uh, of one TCR clone. The alternative is that the drug will bind to the MHC, will get oligoclonal expansion, but what happens here is that the drug uh, binds to the HLA antigen binding cleft and actually change the whole peptide that are being presented. So this is the drug-induced altered self. Actually, a new self is being presented uh, by the MHC. And this can explain transient autoimmunity because there are no true autoreactive T-cell clones, um, but rather transiently autoreactive normal clones. And this cell um, will act again as normal T-cell when the drug will, no, will no, no longer be there. And that might be also relevant to other CD8-mediated Steven Johnson syndrome or 10 with punk. Um, so I wanted to help you with the evaluation form. And if you, have list one, <laughs> if you have to list one thing that you intend to change, and maybe the next time that you get a more severe reaction, you will ask for HLA typing, especially with carbamazepine and abacavir. Um, maybe we should do the patch test to confirm abacavir. But the most, I think that something that we should think about when we see patients with severe systemic uh, reaction, Steven Johnson or 10, then we might want to use drug that, might, that can target T cells, CD8 T cell more specifically. <coughs> and again, will the will patient benefit from that? I don't know. So maybe will they, maybe won't. Do you know if there is um, data uh, testing such therapies? I mean, I know all other, like IVIG for Steven Johnson is harmful and prednisone is potentially harmful. Well, I was thinking about uh, IVAG, and actually it was been effective only with very high doses. I think you should give them about two grams per kilogram. And I was thinking maybe if the Steven Johnson is triggered by a viral infection, um, then maybe you need a high uh, IVAG dose to clear the viral effect, which caused the same reaction. I don't know. There are initial reports about cyclosporin, which was supported, reported to be beneficial, but there are no. Do you think this might explain DRESS syndrome? I mean, carbamazepine. Car carbamazepine DRESS was so. also associated with some of the drugs uh, and some uh, associated with different uh, oh, HLA, yeah, yeah. so maybe. maybe. Yeah. I would be skeptical. I think there's pretty strong evidence that DRESS is due to viral reactivation. Yeah. But you don't I mean, know it, it, the it may be that those HLAs are more prone to reactivation of a virus or something, but I think it would be a different mechanism. Are all of these uh, CD8 cell mediated? These are, um, these are just association between the drug, and the reaction, and the HLA. The only CD8, I mean, there is strong uh, evidence to support that uh, Stephen Johnson is CD8 mediated. I mean, if you take lymphocyte from skin lesion, you'll find CD8 cell. If you adoptively transfer or inject this cell into a mice, then you get similar skin reaction. So the cytokine profile of patients with Steven Johnson, even before they have the disease, fits CD8 activation. So most of the time, these are CD8 activation. I don't know if with all the others, uh, these are also CD8-mediated disease. Actually, some of them are HLA class 2, so I guess it will not be CD8, it might be CD4 as well. So practically, what, what HLA should we potentially send? Um, out of interest, I would say that every time you have to get a severe reaction, it should set for HLA. Uh, but currently, the recommendation of the, uh, of the NIH is for CD, uh, HLA B5701 for Abacavir and HLA B1502 for carbamazepine. Do you know how HLAs are named? Who makes up those names? So, this is the way uh, <laughs> they are named. Thanks, last there's a specific way to name them. And so you get the, the gene, the specific allele group within, and different variation. Um, and every year there are more and more uh, genes that are being, I mean, when you try to sequence the gene, then you get, you'll find new HLA. And if 
If you read uh, January of the 2008 edition, you'll find that there are about 700 uh, HLA class B, HLA B uh, gene. And if you'll check that, the number of the gene by year. So um, the more sensitive the tests are, we find more and more H HLA. The question is what is the significance of this uh, different HLA? Um, so currently there are over almost 2,800 HLA B genes. 1600 HLA C, 2100 HLA A, and every they update it every couple of months, I guess, and there are more and more genes. Higher and higher resolution. Higher and higher resolution, yes. This is just peptide changes. There's different amino acids. Um, they suggest different. Well, I guess what we present, everybody, every person presents peptides that mean. The thing that you present, let me just check that one. Um, the cells in our body are kind of stupid, I mean, in a way to say that, because the cell doesn't know what, I mean, I'm trying to understand what is the logic behind it. I mean, the cell doesn't know if it is infected with something or not. So whatever the cell makes, that's what you will be presented. So if you have different cells in different organs, they most probably present the protein that they produce more uh, in higher doses. And the cell just, it's a wave of surveillance. The cell doesn't know if he's infected with a virus or not. So he's presenting outside, hey, check me, this is what I'm doing. And if I'm presenting or doing something that I'm not supposed to do, either a virally infected cell or tumor cell, then it will be eliminated. Um, so the different HLA, they, I, I don't sure that they exactly affect which kind of peptide you will present. I mean, you can present whichever peptide that your HLA can bind. Uh, and we have different HLAs. Um, the reason for that, I guess, you meant to protect yourself against pathogen in the environment that you used to live in. So back in, I guess, in old age, when people used to live in certain places, didn't move around, every population had the same HLA, which was supposed to help them fight infection that they had at the same place. That's, I guess, the evolutionary rationale. You can also say that you most probably married one of your sisters, and then that's the reason you have the same HLA. But it's a combination of uh, uh, genetics and environmental selection. All right, well, thank you. Lynn, right. before I was like, can I ask, can I ask that question? I need some help. Our GI doctors and our rheumatologists are now asking me, because of all the biologic agents, what do we consider immunosuppressed now? And I tried to look up what the definition of immunosuppressed is, and there's not really a, a unified definition. So does anybody have any guidance for how you would say somebody wants to use Imuran or the, the new biologics when you would describe a patient as immunosuppressed? Well, you can you say that as a point for starting. Why don't you ask Troy Troy? In two weeks. Troy, ask Troy Troy. Anti-IL-5. I was just curious. There, but no. Excuse me. So nobody has a great idea either. One standard definition could be tough. Well, you know, I told them if they're lymphopenic, you know, then they're probably in T-cell population, then they probably are. But the question is, what else do you have to do with energy? That doesn't help them at all.